Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. In this episode, I talk to Charlie, who I think might be a little crazy because listen to what he has done. He started a website in April of 2020, so just a few months ago. When we recorded this, it was like September 1st, something like that. It was like right at the end of the month or so. When we recorded it, he had 431 articles posted. All right, 431. He pinged me like yesterday, a couple days after we recorded the interview, and he has something like 450 articles published. Again, he's only been working on the site through April, May, June, July, and August. Pretty short amount of time. In July, he made $75. In August, he made $175 and got about 10,000 page views or so in August. I think he's made something like five or 10 bucks from Ezoic, something like that. The whole point is he's putting a ton of effort in a huge content sprint. We do get to hear about his background. This is not the first time he's built websites, but it's the first time he's approached it in this fashion with a huge amount of content and a lot of longevity. He's 25 years old. So that's, I think, interesting. Um, I don't know the demographic of the full audience, but a lot of people are you know, roughly my age, so 40, give or take a few years. And I feel like we kind of cluster around that age, although that is probably just me being self-centered and thinking everyone's like me, but it could skew in some other direction. He lets us know that he's spent something like $13,000 on the content, and that's obviously a decent amount of money, but you spread it out over five months, and the fact that he has a full-time job during this period too. So he's fortunate enough to be able to work from home. And this is the cool thing, all right? So he took advantage of this quarantine period and has just been busting his ass, like working really hard. He has outsourced a lot of the content writing because of the sheer volume, but he did write a good portion of the initial content himself. I could ramble on, but I'm going to let Charlie tell his story. I'm excited to have him back on in the future. So uh, Charlie, appreciate it. And let's just get to the interview. So welcome, Charlie. How are you doing today? Good, Doug. Thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to discussing my story. So congrats on your progress so far. I think I'm just shocked because a lot of people do have some nervousness about investing that much into a a project. It sounds like a a staggering amount of uh, content. And we're going to break it all down. But for the people that don't know you, which is most everyone. I actually don't know you much at all either, but what's your story? Like, what do you do for a full-time job? When did you get involved in internet marketing and niche sites? Sure. So I'm actually uh, 25 years old. So I'm about three years out of college. I guess it's kind of better to start with my internet journey because that was before my full-time job. So I, I built websites back in 2013, 2014, and it was more of those type of websites where you create two or three pages, you send a ton of backlinks and they rank. And you made money for a couple of months, then you got penalized and you're on to the next site. Kind of stepped away from that, went to school, came out, got a full-time job. I actually work in finance. And I kind of went back to the internet marketing stuff in March. And I was like, you know, what's going on? How can I make money here? Um, and as you stumble across different internet marketing forums and you know, different YouTubers, I just became intrigued by people putting out massive amounts of content and having them rank without you know, shady backlinks. So that was very interesting to me. I saw a journey that actually inspired me of somebody that put out like 500 articles in about a year and they were making money just on informational content, um, not only focused on Amazon. So I kind of like merged the two together, put out a ton of Amazon articles, then figured, okay, now how can I gate this to like informational articles to really grow traffic? Awesome. And did you have any big wins from like back in the day when you were building some of these early sites and doing more, uh, I guess, shady backlinks and stuff like that? Sure. I definitely hit a few months where I was hitting four or five K a month, but it wasn't continuous. It was almost like the site would rank. I'd cash in on it for two or three months and then it would kind of lose its rankings. 
And it was mostly just forwarding to either other type of affiliate websites, those survey websites where I was getting referral commission. Yeah, I mean, I had success. Nothing where it was like sustained over the long time. I always had to be building new sites. Always positive ROI, but definitely like a lot of work every month just to keep income coming in. And I, I suppose you developed some pretty like good marketing chops and just building websites and WordPress uh, sort of skills and stuff like that. Any other like sort of broader type of skills that you learned from back in the day? So it's interesting. I actually used to use like other platforms like Weebly. And I think WordPress was something that was new to me. So I think it's almost safe to say I kind of entered the marketing itself and building these type of websites kind of fresh. I think the only thing I had going for me was I did understand backlinks and the negative and positive sides to it. So I had a pretty open mind when it was coming to like understanding how backlinks work in 2020. I think that's maybe one thing that kind of helped me more than someone just coming in, throwing up 400 something articles and hoping it works. (laughs) Got it. Cool. So let's get into this project that you're working on now. So in March, you thought, hey, I'm going to get back into this. And you started Googling around and you saw some people publishing a ton of content. So you started this site in basically April. So in those few weeks, like what was your plan? What were you thinking? And why did the scope of this project, why was it so big, like off the bat? Okay, so the original goal was a thousand dollars a month, and I said, okay, to get there, I need a hundred articles. That's the goal. I started, I published all the content on my own. I probably wrote the first fifty or so articles, and the goal was one article a day. Some days I was able to get two, but it was one article a day, and things seemed good. I was like, okay, this is going to be thousand dollars a month a year from now. And I had like two articles ranking for like a really small keyword, getting like three or four clicks a day. And I was like, all right, I need this to go faster. (laughs) I need to get out more content. And everywhere I looked, it was like, hey, backlinks are great. You know, add them to your site. But if you want the real growth, it's content. So I was like, all right, let's get, let's get 50 articles, get to 150 or I'll get a hundred articles, get to 200. And then I just kept scaling up. I did, I did my keyword research. And I think that's what motivated me to say, okay, look, no one wrote a good article on this topic that's you know more than 500 words here's an easy keyword to get 500 views a month i think that's what motivated me to say okay let's start scaling this up let's put a lot of content out there and let's see how it responds but obviously like the first few weeks of just getting those like one or two amazon sales i actually didn't realize how motivating those were just seeing like fruits to your labor um even though it is only a couple bucks but it's like okay my art my website's two months old and it made ten dollars like That's encouraging. So I think that was helpful to start out with. Okay. And let's rewind just a tad. How did you choose the niche? I know this is an important part and you're growing this site large. You're planning on, you know, publishing even more content. So I imagine you pick something broad enough and I'm interested in the process of how you chose it. Sure. So the niche I'm in is actually something I thoroughly enjoy. It is a hobby of mine. Um, It is within the outdoor niche, and I guess I'll leave it at that. But in terms of how I picked the niche, it was almost like I gravitated towards that niche early on just because it was one of the few things I really enjoyed doing that you could build a blog about. And when I was looking at my competitors, I think that's what cemented the decision for me. I saw so many competitors that either had really small websites, I'm talking like 30, 40 posts that were all Amazon-based. Or I saw those massive websites that were 1,000 plus articles that were big companies getting hundreds and hundreds and 500,000 page views a month. And I figured if they're doing it with lower quality content, what if I kind of push the two together? And that was the final decision for me making the site. Okay. And sort of implicitly, I mean, I think there are plenty of informational and product keywords most of the time. It's just people may have a certain mindset, but when you started this, did you automatically see like, oh, there's a ton of info content and there's a ton of products as well? It was funny. I started just thinking every article is going to be about Amazon and I'm just going to have some informational content just to kind of balance the site to Google like the goal was probably like realistically 80% Amazon and 20% informational. So I only thought product wise, and there was obviously a lot of them. And I think at this point now I'm probably, 
I want to say 85% informational. Okay. Do you find that the informational content is quicker to rank or less competition or any, any observations? So, yeah, so definitely easier to rank in terms of competition, but I also just noticed those longer pieces of content, the 2,500, 3,000 word pieces, I can eventually monetize those articles for Amazon products very easily just because they're like those how-to type of guides like, oh, you need this this piece of equipment or you need this type of item. So I kind of said to myself, you know, why only focus on Amazon, make informational content, then bring Amazon into the informational content as those articles start to shoot up the ranks. Perfect. All right. Moving on to keywords. Obviously, if you're going to launch a site, you're going to publish all that content. How did you approach keywords? And uh, actually, I'll leave it at that. How did you approach the keywords and finding all of these? Yeah, so I started by Googling keywords that I thought were low competition just from my understanding of the niche. And I wrote a few articles out there and then I realized they were way more competitive than I thought. So then I started using those type of keyword tools such as Ahrefs or Ubersuggest. And I actually wound up purchasing a premium subscription at Ubersuggest just because it wasn't a lot of money a month. Like I didn't want to put that much into those type of tools. But it gave me enough knowledge to understand a little bit about the site's domain authority that I was competing with and then kind of see what keywords they were ranking. So the first batch of content, Amazon articles and informational content, was pretty much just writing a better article than what was already out there. Then I would say once I hit about 80 to 90 articles, I got the understanding of how to write an article or how to pick a topic that maybe was just not even served yet on the internet that nobody had for. Um, and those really helped the initial growth of my website, picking a topic or an article title that just wasn't written yet, but had juice, had some search. And how did you, I guess, because you're a member of that community for the niche, you probably have more insight, but I'm almost like, I can't imagine a topic that hasn't been covered in some capacity. So how did you find these like really obscure keyword phrases? So it's almost like you start with a generic keyword and then you kind of go to the more specific location within that keyword. For example, and I'll use in a different niche. And actually, um, can you just use like ballpoint pen just to make sure we don't give sure, away someone that's, else's niche? That's perfect. Okay. So instead of saying like best ball, ballpoint pen, I would say like best ballpoint pen in Virginia. But obviously, it wasn't a Amazon type of article. It was like a location type of guide. And I found those to have so much search volume with so much underserved content. Obviously, researching that topic was a challenge. But I almost started getting better at saying, okay, like, what's unique to this location? How can I tweak it towards my website? And then kind of direct my writers on that path. And that made those type of articles a little bit easier and definitely quick to rank. Very cool. And I have no idea what your niche is, but to that point, I believe, and we could talk more uh, off the record, I think from a link building perspective, because there's a location built in, you have the opportunity to reach out to a lot of small, um, more independent kind of websites in those locations to do link building and just outreach in general. So again, I have no idea what it is, but when you put locations in there, a lot of new doors open up and a lot of new opportunities. So have you thought about that at all, by the way? It's funny you mentioned that. I did one kind of campaign where I wrote an article about a specific area and I reached out to all the businesses in that area and I got feed I got responses from four of them and three of them actually wound up like thanking me for the article because I talked about them and they actually linked back to me from their like resources page on their website. I mean, it was a small business, but it was like a unique link that I wasn't really asking for. I was more just saying, hey, like we wrote an article about you. What do you think? <laughs> Perfect. That, <laughs> that is, so cool. yeah, I, I love to hear that. And yeah, you weren't even asking for anything. You were just like networking and becoming someone in the niche. And they're like, hey, cool. No one pays attention to us. We have a small website, but it's so relevant, right? It's like the most relevant kind of link you can get, I imagine. And even sometimes, I think only one of the businesses did willingly, but they may even provide you like a quote or something to say about them. So it even makes like your article that much more accurate, which is even better. 
Very cool. Anything else with the link build or not the link building with the keyword research portion here? I noticed that I wound up picking keywords and kind of sticking to that same type of philosophy within that keyword, and obviously like just changing up. So it was almost like I found a really good keyword, saw it ranked, got some traffic, and I almost built that keyword into a category and branched out to like 30 or 40 different type of informational articles that I'm hoping they kind of duplicate that type of growth just because they're clearly being searched and potentially underserved in terms of content on the internet. Okay. That was an interesting thing I saw. Very cool. And did you happen to use the keyword golden ratio at all, or you went in another route in your previous experience, sort of like you didn't need to use such a structured format like the keyword golden ratio? So I did use KGR for some Amazon type of keywords, and that was definitely like the second stage. So I kind of put out my first chunk of articles, realized too broad, and the KGR was starting to say, okay, write an article on Amazon. This is a good topic. And now I was starting to get a few clicks because I was the only one writing an article for that topic that was getting views for Amazon. So that was helpful, and that gave me an original traffic in Amazon. And that was honestly probably the real reason I started saying, okay, like, good to go to informational articles because the Amazon articles are somewhat working, even if they're only getting a few clicks a day. Okay, cool. All right, moving on deeper into the content. I think this will be sort of like the meatiest part of the interview because just the sheer volume, I have not published like as much content as you have in such a short period. So tell me about the approach. You mentioned that you started writing yourself And I'm sure it was helpful that you're interested in the topic and you're knowledgeable. So that was helpful. And then you realized you need to do more. So what did you do to start bringing on more help? Sure. So yeah, I wrote the first, it was roughly 45 articles or so on my own. And I was like, okay, this will be a good path to a hundred. Then when I started doing the keyword research and just realizing how much more topics to be written about, I was like, okay, maybe it's time to start outsourcing. So once I saw there was some type of growth to the website through like Google Search Console, I started looking for writers. And I think this was a process that I definitely failed a lot in the beginning because I kind of went, oh, I'll go with the cheaper writers. And I use internet marketing forms and different type of article writing websites to get content. And at the end of the day, I wound up actually getting the more expensive writers out of all the ones I used. So most of the content was between, I mean, on the low end, I was probably around two and a half cents a word. And I think on the high side, I, I got to up four cents a word. And I'd probably say most of the content, especially in the big content push parts of it, were probably towards more four cents a word. But it was almost like, okay, here's 50 articles based on the keyword research I did. Let me ship it out, have them work on it. I'll come back, see how it looks. And then I really found like a few writing services I just really liked working with. They got the titles right. They hit the um, subheadings, the H2 subheadings really well. And it was starting to become a lot more of me copying it, pasting it, reading it over quickly, spending five minutes rather than saying, okay, write this article. And I spent like 45 minutes rewriting it, which which was getting a little frustrating. But it was honestly worth the extra few dollars I spent per thousand words just to get that article that was ready to go. In terms of content push, so I'd say after April going into May was probably another slower month of content. But the real big push was in June. And I think June, I put just over 90 articles out. And I really started getting the hang of the keyword research and understanding what topics I wanted my writers to write about. And July was the biggest month in terms of content with 150 articles added. I think so far, well, I guess August is done now, but I probably have a few more I want to put up tonight. But August was probably another one of those 90 months. So I think the moral, I mean, the overall part of that is the big push of content was the last three months. And if that's roughly 330 articles, that means I got, I got a lot that are hopefully sitting in the sandbox ready to rank as the next few months unfold. What gave you the confidence to invest so much when you were seeing, you know, a little traction, but I would say, you know, a fairly small amount, you know, you're getting a few visitors per day. So what gave you the confidence to, you know, put, put a lot of money into this? Oh, it's a good question. I honestly, it took a lot of those nights of me Googling, watching YouTubers, watching your channel, watching other success stories. And it took like probably 20 or so success stories for me to finally say, okay, 
think I'm ready to do it. I think this is the right ingredients. But it really is like in the beginning, it's like you have to harvest all the information out there to make sure you're not missing any corners. Like one thing you didn't want to miss was backlinking. Like, did you want to not do any? Did you want to do too much? Like, it's a fine balance, I thought, to get in between there. So understanding that and seeing what other successes have done, that was big for me. And that was probably my biggest motivation besides traffic early on that made me say, let's let's invest, and let's go in on it. And one thing you didn't say, but I'm curious to get your opinion that I want to sort of like imply. <laughs> I think your previous experience where you have earned a lot of money, you know it's possible to earn online you you've made thousands per month before. So did, do you think that gave you confidence, even though it's been sort of baked into your personality and what you know is possible for a few years? I guess now that I think about it, yeah, that's probably one of the more powerful things that I had going for me. I mean, I knew money could be made online. I never questioned that. It was more the question of, can I make money or a full-time income doing this? So I was not concerned about the internet itself and the people I could reach was more like, how can I monetize it where I can get that desirable income for what I put in? Okay. And, and I'm thinking back from the, you know, the time frame that you mentioned and, you know, COVID-19 and quarantining and stuff hit around the March time frame. And this is what you've done. You've really taken advantage because I know <laughs> you would hear people say, Oh, you know, you really got to take some action. You're all stuck at home. And, if you're willing to mention, like, can you mention where you, where you were living? And I guess you you were buckling down doing a ton of work, right? So can you just tell us a little bit about that being, you know, quarantined and then doing all this work and just what it was like living during that period? Yeah, I mean, Doug, you hit the nail on the head. I, I actually started Googling how to make websites my first full week off of work. And then for those who don't know, I just mentioned that Doug, I actually uh, live in, and work in Manhattan. So kind of getting out of Manhattan, I went back home to, to my parents and being out of the city, I was like, my day is always so full. I never have time to do anything. I'm, you know, wake up five minutes to go to the gym and full day of work. I'm just happy if I'm able to eat at night on time. So kind of having this extra time, I was like, you know, it'd be nice to go back into the website stuff and see what type of money I can make there. And I mean, that was all the time I needed to make a website. So, I mean, COVID was obviously devastating and terrible in many ways and changed my life in a lot. But, you know, I tried to take some positive out of it by saying, you know, let's build a, a business and see how it goes. So that's kind of been a nice thing in a way. And have you been, um, I guess, working from home, like in a general sense, but now you don't have the, the busyness of the city and the other sort of obligations? Is that an accurate assumption? So one thing I've noticed is I actually almost work more working from home. It's almost like you're always on call. But my travel was actually, I had a pretty uh, intense travel and commute to work. It was about an hour, 15 minutes there and back. So kind of saving that time actually makes the day a little better for me. And not having to run around and get changed and all those type of things definitely put so much time back in my pocket. So it's been nice to have that. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I I think from all the people that I've talked to, it sounds like you've done more during this um, period of time where people are stuck at home. Cause I, I, I mean, I see some people are doing, you know, some more things online, but um, you've really taken advantage. I won't disparage anyone who's like not doing more, but I mean, this is amazing. Like all the work that you've done. So let's get back into the content area. So you have some writers um, you've, you've hired uh, some cheaper ones. It seems like, spending more is the wise move. It just saves you time and hassle. And when you get the content, are you the person drafting it in WordPress or how does that work? Do you have a, a editor of any kind? So I have no editor. I get all the content emailed to me or uploaded to the site that I buy it from. And I upload everything. I'm pretty good about like as soon as the article comes in like six hours later it's going to be published on my site i don't like having a bunch of them sit because when i am outsourcing this much content it's almost like if you let those 10 sit then the next 20 that come in you're just going to be all backed up so i try and get them up right away but i guess the real challenge is like when you take an article you're putting the title in that you came up with and the rest of it's there so i'm making sure there's still good subheadings that can potentially address other search terms making sure the paragraphs aren't too large 
Um, I'll try and throw an internal link or so here and there back to another page on my site. And then obviously uploading images, whether it's you know a stock image or free image through Google, or um, I actually take a lot of photos of my own. So getting all that up, um, it's a little quicker now than when I first started uploading articles. I think I could probably do a batch of 10 in about an hour, maybe a little bit less, which is great. But it's usually like I have the picture, like I think of the article, I do the keyword research, I outsource it, and then I go find the picture and like save it to my computer. So like the hardest part, in my opinion, is done already. <laughs> right. Okay. And just to remind us, you said in a particular month, you published 150 articles. So you were doing um, quite a bit, you know, each day getting that out there. Was it stressful in any way or... I mean, was it just motivating? You're like, oh, I got a stack of 10 I got to do today. So let's let's do it. It was definitely motivating. And it's almost like you feel like you have this task that has to get done when you get 20 articles sent to you. So when you get them all uploaded, you feel like, oh, this is great. Meanwhile, like I'm probably not going to see those articles ranking for months from now. But just getting them up did have like a small feeling of accomplishment. And I would try and order the articles where they would come on a day I was like a little less busy. So I knew I had the time to say, okay, I'm probably gonna have like 30 articles coming in the next two days. Like I do have a few hours and usually I try to do it like later at night. <laughs> okay. So you're just, yeah, you're grinding it out. So very cool. Now, have you thought about bringing on an editor in the, in the future or someone to, to do that task of uploading and drafting, placing the images and all that stuff? I've thought about it and I think it's something I'd probably take action on when I build out my second site. I think for this site, I kind of have an idea of what I want to keep putting up there. And I think bringing an editor in this late in the game may not just be like even fair to the editor because kind of like I did it my way for 400 something articles, having them come in to clean up may not be like the easiest move for me, but I did kind of get another website going with 20 something articles. And I figure I could maybe bring on an editor when that site's ready to scale up. Got it. Okay, cool. And anything else content wise before we move on to link building? One interesting thing I did for my content, and I haven't really seen the effects of it yet, but just something to kind of note for informational type of articles that were more than 2,500 words, they were like a complete guide for that topic. I did try to find a YouTube video that I thought was credible and that I personally enjoyed and found helpful online and embedded it into the articles. I've noticed that those articles rank a little bit quicker. I don't know if it's a coincidence or anything, but it's almost like Google picks up, there's a video and there's extra form of content and it may be more helpful. So that's something I'm continuing to do. Not on every article, like for my thousand word, 1500 word articles, I'm not, but for those bigger pieces of content, I'm just trying to be like the ultimate guy for that space. Okay. I usually put a YouTube video in and I haven't like checked to see which works better. But just as a rule, I guess, like the common knowledge when I was coming up was, you know, do that. YouTube has good metadata. Google understands that metadata. So like Google can understand that that topic is on that page, but I've never actually tested it. I just keep repeating it over and over again. So I'm glad at least there's, <laughs> you, you looked at it and you were like, oh, I think maybe so. That's enough for me. I'll keep saying it, I guess. <laughs> One thing to look at just as an aside is a lot of times the embed code from YouTube, it will slow down that page. So there are some plugins. Uh, there's one by DIY plugins or DIY themes um, for, it's like a YouTube performance plugin. Basically it puts in a placeholder, a thumbnail, and the user has to click on the placeholder, that image, and then it'll load. So instead of loading and embedding the video ready to play for every single user, it'll only do it when the person clicks on it. So one thing to look at, it sounds like you're not putting too many videos up, but I know um, some people, I've seen pages with like five videos, like five embedded oh, YouTube wow. videos, and th th that's going to load a lot slower just in general. So the, totally aside, total tangent. And we can move back to um, the link building portion. So link building, I know some people are like, I'm really scared to build any links, but you came from a different background where you were more than comfortable to build links, but now you have a more conservative hand. Can you talk about your link building approach uh, so far, just a few months in here? Sure. So understanding my background and how links used to work then, 
I was very cautious now because of what happened then. However, I did want to build links the right way or, you know, the best way possible for the site to grow faster. So I kind of focused on three type of links. The first one was guest posts. Second one was niche edits. And the last one was just building web 2.0 links. Now I know web 2.0 links have like the more spammy type of background, but what I did with those when my site first launched, I'm talking my site had like 20 articles. I hired a writer for like $6 a thousand words and they just produced original content about my topic, create a bunch of web 2.0s that had three to five pages. And those were like my foundational type of links, built about 10 of them up front. And then from that point onward, everything was just guest posts, niche edits, and having actual links from the businesses I was writing about. So guest posting, I went about that where I tried to save as much money as I could early on to really help with the content later on. But I reached out directly to websites in my industry and said, hey, you know, can I write an article for you? Or, hey, you know, this topic could really help you bring some traffic. I almost like when I did my outreach, I tried to be different. And what I would first do is not only I'd introduce myself, but I'd say, hey, I have experience writing articles that can rank in Google. This could bring you traffic. This helps you because you want more visitors. This helps me because I'm trying to build a blog that has no authority yet, without saying the word authority. And people were actually pretty receptive to that. I had this one small business across the country that was actually willing to have me write a page on their website about a topic within my space. And they gave me author credit at the bottom and they gave me a backlink to my website, which was awesome. So that was like an early link early on. And then from that point on, I was like, okay, time to scale this up. Let's get some links. And I started buying niche edits and guest posts probably around 10 or 15 a month. Obviously, it all wasn't in one day, but through over the course of a month, I'd get about 10 to 15, probably DA authority, 40, 50 plus. Um, I tried to get really high quality, expensive links because I knew I wanted to have like a cleaner site that just had powerful, respected links within my niche. Try to keep everything within the niche. Okay. Very good. And for the web 2.0s, I'm just going to define a couple of things for folks that don't know. So the web 2.0s are going to be like free blog, blog sites that you can like spawn up. So it's like wordpress.com. And usually it would be like, um, you know, some like Charlie's website dot, um, wordpress.com, something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you said you did something like 10 of those or so, you got a few pages and these were a lot more common back in the day. And I think nowadays, um, I, I usually don't recommend it, but I know people still use them and it sounds like there's no ill effects with what you've done there. So the other part is the niche edits. So for people to know, that don't know, can you describe what those are? Sure. So I had a provider that I used that provided niche edits. And what they would do is rather than creating a guest post, which is like a new page or a new article, they'd go find something within my topic that they can add a backlink to. So maybe it was a news article from 2017 on a you know reputable website. And they could say, okay, rather than not having a link there, you know, let's link to my website. And I would pay a pretty good premium for those links. But my goal was to order in bulk. So I kind of told my provider, hey, I'm buying this many links over the next two or three months. And I did get a more like a wholesale discount. But those links are great because not only are you getting your site on a high authority site with traffic potentially, but those pages already have like link juice built up. So if they're done strategically and on older websites, like you can get link juice that's been building up for who knows, eight or 10 years right to your site right off the bat. So it can be pretty effective. And I think that was a little element to my growth early on from those links once they started kicking in. Perfect. For the guest post, you mentioned that you actually just did outreach and you sort of gave a different kind of pitch than what people normally would see. So I'm curious, did you send these to businesses or to more like bloggers? So the first outreach was to only bloggers. And then once I kind of like saturated my space or sites I actually wanted to be on within my space, I kind of ran out of ground. So I, my next approach, and I only kind of did this once, was I actually wrote an article specifically for outreach. And what it did was it was a review type of article for businesses within my area. 
And I reached out to all the businesses in my area and I heard back from about four of them. And the question is, oh, like, how'd you reach out to them? Like, I even went on Facebook for some of them and they were responding to me on Facebook and saying like, oh, great article. Like, thanks for sharing. And then I'd either reply back like, oh, like, you know, I'm happy to work with you guys in the future and, you know, write another article about you guys. And what I started noticing is (laughs) they were adding my article link or my my homepage or my website onto their like resources page and like tools tab which is kind of neat i was getting like a free backlink without even asking for it or paying for it and i was building some credibility in my community <laughs> perfect and just to uh, make sure i understood so you you would like write a review article about a company and then you would send it to them because it was a positive review and they're like hey this is fantastic is that basically what was going on yeah, I first started the article as three reviews and it wound up being like a thousand words. And then I started saying, okay, every paragraph I write, not only is it more content for the page to rank, but it's another firm I can reach out to. <laughs> so I started doing a review on like 10 or 15 places and I emailed them all. And, I mean, or Facebook outreach and only got about four replies, but three of them became links, which was great. <laughs> Perfect. That's amazing. And how, how long after you started your site did you start? sort of outreach like this to real people, no no paid stuff, but just real outreach to people. That was in within the first month. It was all of it was within the first two months, but I, I figured in my head, there was no reason to wait on that because nothing I was doing was shady or something that Google wouldn't like. I was making real connections and talking to small businesses. And I think a lot of those areas or businesses that I would talk to their locations kind of matched up with the first couple articles on my site. So it all like kind of made sense. Perfect. Charlie, this is amazing because I see, um, I mean, YouTube is just, it's a mess out there. Sometimes you know how it is, but there's a lot of folks that, um, that they're like, it's totally unnatural for a new website to get links. And I'm like, that's fucking bullshit because anyone who is a marketer is going to go out and promote their site and network within their niche. And if they've been around the block, they have a network already. So they're going to promote stuff. Yeah, it's totally natural to get backlinks and promote your site. So it just doesn't make sense to me why people think that, hey, yeah, I'm going to start a new site and then I'm going to not tell anyone about it for the next six months. Stupidest thing in the world. Any any comments on that rant? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. I actually... Obviously, since my past backlink experience back in 2012, 2013, I was really cautious. And I actually saw someone make a good point. They said with the coronavirus going on, think of all these new coronavirus websites, whether statistics or you know, informational, they're all coming out here. They're not really ranking for any keywords right away, but they're getting tens and hundreds of thousands of links a month right now. You think they're going to get penalized? Like, no, as long as they're credible and good links and things were done correctly, like, it's fine. Like, there's going to be bad links in there, but there's going to be so many good links that Google's going to say, I mean, the site, we have to look at it. Like, we have to see what's going on. Right. (laughs) So that kind of said to me, like, if they're getting links like crazy, me putting up 10 or 15 links a month is more than fine. And I've actually probably put up roughly 20 links a month altogether. And do you have any sort of uh, like guideline on how quickly you'll build those links? Do you have any benchmarks that help, helps guide that? So outside of me just outsourcing the links on like the first day of the month for that month, I really don't. I mean, when I tell my provider for the links, I say, you know, please try and do outreach or the niche edits over the course of the month. I don't want them all in one day. But I think getting paranoid over, you know, spacing out every two days, three days is a little too much. I'm not saying build all 30 links in one day, but like, think about it. How, what would a natural website do? If they had an article go viral, they might get half of their links for that month in those two days. So that was kind of my approach and just not worry about little things like that. Just build good links, quality links, and try and be on websites that I thought could help my website grow. Perfect. I think I, I agree with everything that you're saying there as far as like the velocity and, um, just the relevancy. It sounds like you're aiming for pretty relevant kind of sites as well. Do you have any issues or have you seen any issues with any of the quality of the links that you're getting? I've seen no issue with quality. I think what sometimes happen is like, I did get a link here and there where it was from an article that really wasn't about my topic. They might've made like a reference or it was even like a metaphor within the article. And that was my link. I kind of went back to my provider and I was like, I mean, the link's nice and all. It's an authoritative website, but 
no one's going to be clicking on that link saying, oh, I want to go read his website. It just didn't look as natural to me. I wouldn't get too crazy about it. It was like a link here or there, but I just tried to stress more like relevancy. I want to add value even to the backlink article. I want it to be like natural. So a few here and there, I'd say maybe around 10% of the links I'm getting were under that bucket. Okay. Any other sort of guides or interesting things with the link building? One thing I'm trying to test now is <laughs> the power of internal link building. I have some articles ranking for the snippet that have no internal links and weren't mentioned in any other article I wrote. Obviously, I have some that are not. My site's early on. It's really hard to give a fair assessment. But roughly half my site has internal links on it to other pages on my site, and the other half don't. I'm testing the theory of whether or not they matter. My guess off the bat is it all depends on what your article's about and what the searches are about. So I think if you're writing an article that maybe doesn't satisfy a topic that's real obvious, having an internal link to another page could help it. But I kind of want to see that theory play out. And I guess the same for external links as well. If I'm forwarding someone else to a resource, does that help my SEO? Okay. From what I, and again, I haven't done like testing in a specific way, especially with a control, but internal links seem to be really helpful. And I know for at least one or two sites where there weren't very many internal links, when I went through and added them over hundreds of posts, like traffic went up and the rankings went up like across the board. Like it was a very positive oh. thing. So I would say go ahead and do it. Like probably not going to hurt anything, especially where it's relevant and you're helping point people in the right direction. So definitely makes sense to do. My, my only question there is Doug and this, you probably you can answer this very easily. When I do my internal links, I notice I do more of a, okay, here's the article. And then at the bottom I go, you may also be interested in, and then I hyperlink my article title. I probably do that more often than I like to admit rather than just like, strategically inserting it within the article unless it's like a buyer intent keyword you think that's going to hurt me by putting it at the bottom as like a read more but it is it is relevant but it's just like i kind of save that till the end to keep them on the page longer like most of my um most of my facts they're more like assumptions that i haven't tested so this falls in the same category things are working out fine though so i think it's probably mostly right I think you're fine. I think it's better if you do add a few in the content versus putting them, you know, mostly all at the end. I think, again, I haven't tested it, but I think you end up with like a more powerful link if it's earlier in the content. And there are there are tools like uh, Link Whisper does make it very easy to insert links, especially from the old post to the new one. That's the harder one to do because you have to go back and edit. Is that the is that an area where you're like, yeah, it's kind of a pain. I don't go back to the old articles. I'm like between it's a pain to go back and I don't want to affect rankings if there is anything going on already. Like I don't want to do anything negative, which I know it won't. But Link Whisper is something I've looked into. And I think as my website gets a little bigger, Link Whisper will probably be my best friend for internal links. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, dude, your site's like, what did you say, 471? Uh, Is that how many posts you have currently? I'm at 431. And I think by the end of this weekend, I should probably get to around 460, 470. Makes me feel <laughs> very lazy, but it, you're doing a ton of work. You're doing a ton of work there. So yeah, I would say internal links, you know, go ahead and do it ahead of time. There's no no reason to wait. And the more, the more articles you publish and accumulate, the longer it'll take you to catch up. So I would say, start, start it now. Go ahead and get started with that now. Now, yeah, I should. <laughs> did, did you, um, have you made any sort of big blunders or mistakes so far on this site? I did have some struggles with the themes. I was wasting money on themes that I never wound up using and paying developers to import the theme for me when I was intimidated by WordPress. Looking back, WordPress is very easy to use. And after watching a few minute video on YouTube, it's easy to do. But I probably could have saved several hundred dollars there on both ends, themes and installing the theme and setting up the site. Other than that, I mean, I've, I've mentioned my struggles with some cheaper content providers. 
I think the solution to that was I just had to spend some extra time editing the piece of article. But there is a lot of articles that definitely got through the cracks in the beginning that maybe aren't the highest quality that I would like to go back and edit. But I figured, you know, as I'm building my site, get the content up, see where it sits, and I can always go back and and touch that up. Okay, cool. That makes sense. That's not too bad of a mistake. Um, And I think, again, a lot of times when you hear uh, success stories, a lot of times people have more experience than on on the surface. Like the headline for this podcast and and YouTube video is probably going to be fairly sensational. But how many websites have you built like in your whole life, would you say, if you had to guess? My whole life, a profitable website or just a website that provided some type of purpose for something? Any kind of website. I think I probably built around 25 websites or so, but not a single one was WordPress until I started with these type of niche authority sites uh, in March or April. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, there, you have built, you have built a lot of them in the past and it, I mean, it helps because again, you had confidence, you knew that you could invest money, probably be okay. And that sort of thing. So at this point in time, I mean, you've only made, um, a few bucks and I think now's a good, good time to reveal how much you've invested so far. So if you, if you could share whatever you feel comfortable and break it down however you would like. Sure. So I probably invested roughly 13,000 in content. Um, I think beyond that, I probably put about another thousand in, in high quality links. I definitely saved a lot of money doing my own outreach for guest posts early on and trying to get those like smaller business type of links. But the goal at this point now is to probably hit 500 articles and then only invest in new content for the money I'm bringing in. So I kind of made a big step in the last week on monetization, start adding ads to my website. So between Amazon ads, I think the site should start making hopefully $400, $500 a month starting in September, just based on the current traffic traffic trajectories. Perfect. And you, you mentioned display ads. You can go ahead and share like who you're working with if you'd like. And just curious how that process has gone so far. Yeah, so I think out of all the things for my website, this is probably one of the things I spent the most time on in terms of researching before I took action on. Um, so I work with Ezoic now. I joined them last Monday. So it's been a full week now. When I first joined, my EPMV was around five bucks. And I talked to my manager and they were like, oh, you know, over the course of time, we're going to get you up to a level that's a little bit more exciting. No guarantees, but as our test system goes through and we see what ads work well with your website, it'll start going up. So, of course, now I'm at $10, which is great, I think, for one week for EPMV. Um, And that's making about five bucks a day because I'm getting roughly 500 views a day now. Um, where probably 75% of that's from, from Google search. I think that, so back on the topic of ads, I was really hesitant to add Ezoic ads on my website only for the reason that it would slow down my website's speed. And I didn't want that to hinder its growth, especially because I was putting out so much content that was in the sandbox. I was like, okay, this is probably the most important six months of my website. You now I want to come back next year and be like, okay, now I can add ads because I have 100,000 page views a month, hopefully, or something like that. And after looking into it, I think adding ads is great early on once you have decent amount of traffic to make money. Because think about all these months, I could have you know, not capitalized or monetized that traffic. I mean, I could have made an extra $750,000 if I did or did not do ads. So I went with Ezoic. I have the intention that you know I want to eventually get to the bigger ad networks if Ezoic isn't paying me something that gets me really excited. But I think the process so far has been great. Their team is awesome. Their customer service is great. And you know, if you told me back in June or, or May I'd have ads on my website by end of August, I'd probably laugh. But this, the growth is going pretty pretty fast, and it, it's exciting once you start getting to the ad networks. Very cool. And as far as your your goals, you mentioned you know one, you still got the full time job. You are growing this site. You've started another one, it sounds like. So where where do you see this sort of moving in a long-term way? 
So I always played with the idea of growing the website to a level that I thought I kind of peaked. I couldn't add too much more content to it, let it sit for a few months and then sell it for whatever it's worth. I think at this point now, I kind of take the hobby side of it and the like fun of signing it every day and checking new keywords ranking and earnings made like as like the best part of it. So I think at this point now, I kind of want to get this website up to hopefully 500 articles, slowly add content to it and then build my second site out to hopefully another 250, 300 articles over the course of the next six months to eight months. That site, I I didn't really mention it much. It has like 24 articles on it. I just kind of have it sitting. It's only about a month old. But I think it's great to have these websites set up, put the content into it, understand what you did with it, and then kind of let them sit and see what comes out of it. I may sell the site a year from now, two years from now, who knows. But I think just having it up there, gives you the option to do both. So I think that in itself is is definitely an achievement. I, I don't really have an idea about leaving, you know, work full time to do this. I think I've managed where I can do both. And I honestly enjoy doing both. It's kind of nice to, you know, pick up one one thing a day, do that, do my full time job and then put that down and do this, which doesn't really feel like a job. This is more like a hobby. This is this is a lot of fun. This is awesome. And we'll see where it goes. Cool. And you mentioned that you're, you know, you like the hobby. You like the um whatever the niche is, would you, or have you thought about like just doing more and expanding the platform in that area? So is it something that you would enjoy? Like, do you like it enough? Like I like beer enough where I would do beer stuff like all the time. Right. Would you be able to like start a podcast and a YouTube channel and like become like a personality in that area? It's a good question. So I probably thought about the YouTube channel more than anything as like a, as a, I guess, a way to expand my website and kind of reach new people. I think unfortunately though, that is a very competitive niche for what my thing is. I'm mean, it probably would require a significant amount of time to put out good content to make it worthwhile for me. I think it's not something I'm ruling out. I think that'd probably be the coolest thing if I could do it. It just probably would take significantly more time, I think, than my blog schedule is right now. Right. Yeah. Well, you never know. I was going to say, you know, in three three to five years, the blog could be big enough where like if you started a channel or did something else, like there's a big enough audience that you could just sort of bring along and sort of skip, skip the uh, beginning part, that sort of the tough part where you're under a, say a thousand subscribers or some kind of thing like that, where you could just bring them over and just short, shortcut it. Cause three to five years is a long time for, for these kind of sites. So very cool. So you're going to keep growing, build more sites and just see what happens. It's, it's just fun, fun right now. Huh? It's fun right now. I mean, obviously you think about the money you put into something, but I think it's starting to make enough money a month this early on where it's like, okay, I think this is just the beginning of hopefully something that just keeps on growing. I mean, even just from the Amazon earnings growth, like a real small part of my website's monetized with Amazon. And I went from under $100 to I just missed $200 this month. I think I hit 175 And then once ads start kicking in, I mean, I made $25 already in one week of ads. So as that stuff starts to climb, it just justifies like, okay, the process is working, keep going. And at the end of the day, not, not even one of my articles had six months to rank yet. So wow. It's definitely encouraging. So kind of wrapping up here, do you have any tips for people who want to replicate your success so far? So I think a lot of people say this, and I think even having money to back up your investment, I would always recommend you definitely write the first few articles on your first mega site. I think it gives you an idea of where you can go from there in terms of what type of content you can have, both Amazon, informational it kind of opened me up to saying, okay, if I outsource this article, are they going to be able to write and research content that actually satisfies that query? Because it's almost like people think they outsource these articles and they're going to get this topic back. It's like, well, there's nothing on the internet and it's a pretty difficult topic. Like, what do you expect the writer to write? So kind of writing the content on your own and going through the steps of research definitely opened my eyes to saying, okay, I can have somebody else Google this topic, find five relevant pages and you know, put it all together and make it a better summary or a better piece of information for someone. So I think that's definitely a key to starting. Another thing I would say is, and I had a few people reach out to me on one of the internet marketing forums I'm on, 
they always send me like they work on a site and it's just Amazon affiliate early on. And they're real, all writing articles about topics that have already been written before for product reviews. Like if you're in a niche, especially something that maybe you have extra knowledge in, try and find out like what's unique or different about that topic that you have some superior knowledge to. And you could probably write a product review on something that doesn't scream out Amazon affiliate right off the bat. And that could be an easy way to get traffic early on. I guess it kind of goes back to the KGR method, but like try and look at those topics that aren't like the generic, like Amazon, like best ballpoint pen, like try and look at something that like is an Amazon product, but you can kind of tweak it in your own unique way or you're the only article that maybe introduces or satisfies that, that search. Are you in public anywhere? Can people follow you or are you kind of sort of off, off the radar here? So I have a journey thread on one of the internet marketing forums. I think I will think about how I can make this a little bit more like you can follow the journey, whether it's just maybe giving you updates, Doug, or something along those lines. Um, I guess just for the end of the video, we can say, Right now, I'm at roughly you know 350 organic searches a day from Google. Winds up being just under 500 clicks with search with uh, direct traffic and social. For some reason, I'm getting a lot of traffic from that Google Discovery thing. I publish like a new article and it goes viral for like a few days, and it comes up as like direct traffic. It just started probably three weeks ago, but it's added like an extra 100, 150 views to my site a day, but only on like newer articles. But I'll try and give an update whenever I can, maybe on a monthly basis to start. And then if you feel like it's opportune to jump back on and give the story, I'm happy to, to jump back on and kind of give my updates. But we'll hopefully get to 500 articles by the time we talk next and hopefully uh, 25,000 page views. That's the goal. Awesome. By then. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Thanks, Charlie. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Thanks again, Doug. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie, for spending the time with me and telling the story. If people have questions, please send me an email, feedback at doug.show. And I'm sure, you know, Charlie was more than willing to hop on and talk some more. I think it'll be uh, pretty interesting to see how it goes over the next couple months. And then further, once he gets past the six-month period, and then once he gets past a year, I think his site's probably going to explode with growth and the timing it's just amazing because he's going to be getting out of the sandbox around the retail season, which typically um, helps a lot of sites grow just naturally and on their own. They will see a, a pretty significant boost in traffic depending on the niche. So looking forward to hear more, hearing more from him. Before I send it off, I do want to, what, what accent was that? What that, that was weird. Uh, my wife and I have been watching uh, Shit's Creek on Netflix, which is pretty funny. And the one of the it's like an ensemble sort of cast, but one of the leads is uh, Catherine O'Hara. Is that her name? Oh shoot, I should have looked it up. But anyway, she has this weird, indistinguishable accent. Mo Moira is her name on the show. So if you don't watch the show, this probably just sounds like nonsense. So back on track. The point here is. You should sign up for the Niche Site Project email list if you're not on there already. You just go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, and then enter your name and email address, and I send you a bunch of templates. So I think a lot of the listeners are on, but I always want to um, encourage people to head over there. I do see questions often where people are like, oh, you know, what kind of template would you use when you're hiring a writer on Upwork, for example, because I want to tie it into the content for this episode. And I have those. I have templates for the job listing. I have templates for the onboarding. I have a template if you need to let the person go, you need to fire them, that sort of thing. So I try to give a lot of good, valuable content out there on Niche Site Project and the email list. And I just send out helpful emails. Sometimes I am uh, just sending links to things that I'm interested in. So things that I'm thinking about, I put pictures in there sometimes and they often have nothing to do with marketing. They're just, it's like a picture of my dog, something like that. All right, I'll let you go and have a good day out there. We'll catch you on the next episode. 